like to welcome you to St. John's United Church this morning, but I'd like to take uh, just a moment this morning and, and tell you about a St. John's Christmas hamper program. Every year at Christmas, St. John's helps those in need in the K0L1L0 postal code area. Last year, we helped 124 families, which included 111 children. We provided gift cards for food for the family and gift certificates for every child under 18, either for toys or clothes or whatever they chose. We gave out over $31,000 in gift cards and certificates. And we have a lot of local organizations and individuals that have donated to this good work and, and we thank them for that. But I am taking this moment to ask each of you to consider giving to this cause if you're able. We can't be sure, but we suspect that this year we will see a large increase in the amount of families we serve because of the current financial situation in our country. So if you are able to give, you can do so in two different ways. At our website, I'll, I'll try to have that link uh, listed here. The, it's www.stjohnscampbellford.ca, ST for Saint. You can also call the office and I'll put that number on here too and leave a message and someone will get back to you. If you do choose to donate online, please be sure to mark your donation for Christmas slash benevolence. And thank you for considering this and thank you for joining us in worship this morning. Peace be with you. Within your will, O Lord, all things are established and there is none that can resist your will. For you have made all things, the heaven and the earth and all that is held within the circle of heaven. You are the Lord of all. Almighty ever-living God, who in the abundance of your kindness surpass the merits and the desires of those who entreat you, pour out your mercy upon us to pardon what conscience dreads and to give what prayer does not dare to ask. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. Alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold or silver, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my heart. and I long to worship you. You're my friend and you are my brother, even though you are a king. I love you more than any other, so much more than spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. Psalm chapter 5. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Give heed to my sighing. Listen to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice, in the morning I plead my case to you and watch. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness, evil will not sojourn with you. 
The boastful will not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in awe of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. For there is no truth in their mouths. Their hearts are destruction. Their throats are open graves. They flatter with their tongues. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Because of their many transgressions, cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them so that those who love your name may exalt in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover them with favor as with a shield. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. God, who does not need to be enriched with any gifts that we may bring, yet who loves the cheerful giver. Receive these, our offerings, which we present before you, and with them ourselves, our souls and our bodies, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Job chapter 1, verses 6 to 12. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a fence around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand now and touch all that he has, 
and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, all that he has is in your power, only do not stretch out your hand against him. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 to 19. But as for you, man of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, It is he alone who has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. The Holy Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. And you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son and he named him Jesus.
Dear friends, Jesus dares us to believe that with faith we can change the world. Taking his word to heart, let us pray for a new heaven and a new earth. We pray in thanksgiving for all who have brought home to us the power of faith. May their example be an unfailing source of inspiration for us. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for all who have been baptized in Christ. May they fan into flame the Spirit's gift of power and love and self-control. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for peace in Ukraine and every place of armed conflict. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for our municipal elections and wisdom in choosing our leaders. May our leaders serve our community with selflessness and wisdom. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the congregations of Campbellford and especially for our own congregation, which includes St. John's United Church, those who meet at Island Park, and those who join us online and on the radio. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the family and friends of those who are recently deceased or whose anniversary of death occurs around this time, that they will be enfolded in the loving arms of God. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. All embracing God, you never cease to look with love on everything you have made. Make us faithful servants of your goodness. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. I find it strange that our modern world, in comparison to the ancient world, seems to have a harder time believing some of the claims of the gospel, things like miracles. Now, some argue that people in ancient history thought miracles were the norm. They weren't as sophisticated or as knowledgeable as we are today. I think I would agree that the ancients were a little more open to the idea of miracles, but the idea that it was the norm for them, I don't think so. We can see this in the story of the virgin birth in the Gospel of Matthew. Notice how Joseph responds to the news of Mary's pregnancy. He doesn't say, Oh, it must be a virgin birth, because she wouldn't cheat on me and I haven't had relations with her. No, Joseph is going to dismiss Mary, break the contract they had, because obviously Mary wasn't faithful. Yes, we are told Joseph is a righteous man, so he will do so quietly, but he is still going to dismiss her. He knew, like all of us today know, a woman doesn't get pregnant unless they have had relations with a man. The only reason Joseph changed his mind was because an angel came to him in a dream and informed him that Mary's conception was via the Holy Spirit. There is nothing wrong with questioning these miracle stories. Obviously, even Joseph questioned them. These are not the norm. But the reason I said it seems odd that our modern world finds it harder to believe miracles is because of the knowledge we have. Oh, I know, the opposite is usually argued. We have more knowledge now. That is why we can dismiss these absurd claims. I really think the opposite is true. This extra knowledge we have should show us that we, we don't know how everything works. Can I give a few examples? People in the Middle Ages and earlier thought it was possible that God, through the Spirit, could speak to you through the, the air. Now, we know better, right? I'm being a little 
sarcastic in some of these. We know better, right? It is impossible for people to hear things from someone else without being present in the same room or at least close by. Oh wait, that isn't true. We have phones. But there has to be a cable between these phones, right? Oh wait, now we have cell phones. Okay, so maybe that isn't a good example. How about this one? People used to think you could speak to God and get an answer, but we know that you can't get answers from just speaking into the air, unless there's a real person there. Oh wait, how about, hey Google? Hey Siri? Hey Alexa? That's not a good example either. How about this one? We know today, far better than the ancients, that pregnancy must happen between a man and a woman. There is just no other way. Oh wait, there is Dolly, the cloned lamb. Okay, but that's a little unusual. Oh wait, in vitro fertilization. Okay, okay, but in nature this never happens naturally. Or does it? I am reading from science.org. Quote, known formally as parthogenesis, virgin birth occurs when an embryo develops from an unfertilized egg cell. The development of an embryo usually requires genetic material from sperm and egg, as well as a series of chemical changes sparked by fertilization. In some parthenogenic species, you hear that? Parthenogenic species, egg cells don't undergo meiosis, the typical halving of the cell's chromosomes, before dividing into new cells. These offspring are generally all female and clones of their mother. Other forms of parthenogenesis occur when two egg cells fuse after meiosis. That's from science.org. Komodo dragons are one example of parthenogenic species. Just a female. Okay, I know I'm being a little sarcastic, but I'm not doing too well. Here am I. Well, how about this one? You can't fail with this one, can we? Death. How about that? We know everything dies. Oh wait. Except some types of jellyfish. To the best of our scientific knowledge, they apparently live forever. So do you hear what I'm saying? Science hasn't demonstrated that miracles are impossible. If anything, science shows that there are possibilities beyond our understanding. If we humans can figure out how to do all these amazing things like cloning and other things like that, and we, and we also now see examples of these things in nature, why is it not at least possible that a being on a much higher level than us could do even more? Is it not possible that a supreme being could change the rules or interfere with the rules just like we humans do, only on a much grander scale? C.S. Lewis gives a, a couple of good illustrations in this matter. Consider this. You put $10 and quarters in your top drawer tonight. Tomorrow morning, how much money will be in the top drawer? Will it be $9? No, because math doesn't change, right? You count it up, it's still the same. There will be $10. Unless, and here's the, point in part, the important point, unless someone without your knowledge takes some of it out. Science is like math in this case. The, the amount will always add up to the same unless someone interferes with that amount. Or consider billiards. You strike the white ball, which then strikes another ball, and it has a clear path to the pocket. Will it go in? Sure, because the rules of physics stay the same, don't they, in our world? Unless someone would stick their hand in front of that ball and stop it, interfere with it. We as humans have learned how to interfere with the normal rules. Why can't God? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, and in his only Son, Jesus Christ, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Why does God choose this way? Why doesn't God make his presence and actions more clear? That's some questions people may have. Or why doesn't God choose a better way? Why not, for instance, have Jesus appear fully grown and tell us in, in very clear words that he is God's son and, and he has a message for us? I think there are at least two reasons this wouldn't work. First, why would we believe this message and this person any more than the way it did happen or the way we have had it revealed to us that it happened? Wouldn't it be just as easy to mock and disbelieve a fully grown man who claims to be God? Two, there's actually a theological reason. 
Jesus was to share in our experience. He was to be truly human and truly divine. But to be truly human meant he had to be conceived, born, grow, learn, in every way like us. He shared in our humanity that we might share in his divinity. And I do think there's perhaps one more reason God hasn't made things overly clear, might we say, why, why faith is still so important. And it relates to the book of Job. It seems as if we humans are a bit of an experiment. Not an experiment in the normal scientific manner, but an experiment in faith and love. It is an experiment for us as humans to observe and for other spiritual beings that are watching over this creation to observe, angels and demons. Think of it this way, because this is in essence what Satan challenges God with in the, in the book, uh, Job. If you have lots of money, how do you know your friends are really friends? That they really love you for you and not because you are rich? Or what if you have lots of power? How do you know that people are listening to you out of love or listening to get something from you or to protect themselves? There are many stories of powerful kings and rulers who pretend to be peasants. Why? In order to know if the people really love who they are. God already knows that answer. He knows our hearts. But we don't know our own hearts. And neither do the other spiritual beings who exist. Faith and trust. Do we trust God even when things don't seem to be going our way? If God allows Satan, as he did with Job, to test us to see if we remain faithful, would we pass the test? Would you? Would I? Allow me to come back to, to this discussion about how God reveals God's self. Do you know a better way? It is always so easy to be critical of others in the way they do things. We all seem to claim that we know how things should be done. If I was the mayor, if I was the premier, if I was the prime minister, I'd fix things. Bet you I wouldn't. Bet you you wouldn't. It's not as easy as we think. Even as, as clergy, as ministers, we come in with these idealistic thoughts and, and notions, especially when we first start, but soon we realize we don't have all the answers. Sometimes we have very few answers. Do you have a better way? How would you have done this? Assuming, I of course believe God exists, but let's assume for a moment, for those of you who might doubt this, let's assume for a moment God exists. God created the universe and us and gave us free choice. If you were God, how would you fix this problem that humans created in rebelling against God that wouldn't have worse difficulties than what we see now? Even take simple things. What color should grass be if you're creating? What color should the sky be? Those things don't really matter. But here's ones that would. How could you create humans that they could be free to choose and yet not be able to choose to rebel? Both are not possible, are they? Can you think of a way? Or you make humans. How could you show them that you care for them, that you love them, without taking away their freedom to reject that love? or force that love on them? How could they know they love you if you were God, while at the same time this love not being forced upon them? I ponder these things myself sometimes, and I can't think of a better way. Maybe you can. In a story Jesus relates, he tells of a man that was sent to Sheol, hell, and this man called out to Abraham, who is on the other side, let me go and warn my brothers of what lies beyond. Abraham replies, even if someone should rise from the dead, they will not believe it. Of course, Jesus was alluding to his resurrection. Even when someone is resurrected, some may still not believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Peace be with you. Go into the world in the power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill your high calling as servants and soldiers of Jesus Christ. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.